Good morning. Welcome to the Telecom Exchange CEO Roundtables, both for our guests here at Telecom Exchange New York City and for our viewers joining us on demand on RCR TV and JSA TV. Our first panel is on a great timely topic, IoT myths and realities, the future is now. Panelists include Jonathan Martone, the Director of Co-location and Engineering at Six Terra Technologies. James Nesfield, the CTO of Chirp. Tamara Budek, Vice President of Services of Digital Realty. David Erickson, Founder and CEO of FreeConferenceCall.com and CarrierX. And Nancy Green, right in the middle there, Global Healthcare Business Development and Strategy Executive Leader of Verizon. This all-star panel is moderated by a dear friend of mine, Mr. Rob Powell. He's the editor and creator of one of our finest industries blogs, Telecom Ramblings. Personally, hand to God, I read his blog every morning with a big cup of coffee. I'm addicted to Telecom Ramblings. And if you haven't checked it out yet, I, I definitely recommend it. It's telecomramblings.com. His analysis, his maps, his Q&As with top sea levels and more is truly a great resource for our industry. And Rob's telecom love and expertise is evident throughout. Little known details about Rob, time to make you blush. Prior to blogging, he spent 10 years as a software engineer at Bentley Systems, and he has a master's in chemical engineering from Princeton. All the way from across the river, New Jersey, my friend, please welcome Mr. Rob Powell. Oh, thank you, Jamie. Uh, <laughs> Telecom Rumblings have been around for nine years now, and I've known Jamie since the first one, so it's been a long, been a long trip. Uh, so, the Internet of Things. Uh, it's, it's mentioned in every PR about every product today to justify just about everything. And so what I was hoping we were going to be able to do today is to talk about what it really is to us in the industry, what types of products and things are out there and what types of things people are really doing. Okay? Uh, what can we really expect and when can we expect it to, to really actually see this kind of stuff? And I don't think I've had five people on a panel, so this is going to be interesting. This is the, the most well-populated one I've, I've tried to, to, to moderate. Uh, but I'd like to go through each, each of you and uh, get an idea of what, where you're coming from on Internet of Things and what your perspective is, and we'll go from there. So, Jonathan, first you. Sure. So, from my perspective, the Internet of Things um, is here now, right? Everybody's using some sort of wireless device. Um, utilities are using smart meters. So all these, all these devices are, are here now, and it's only growing. I think by 2020, it'll be uh, 8.4 billion or something like that. So from, from, from an IoT standpoint, it's here. Um, and it's important that the IoT providers put their gear, their infrastructure, in a hardened data facility that has multiple carriers to mitigate single points of failure and also security features. Um, I think we're going to talk about security later, but security, uh, interconnectivity are the two most important elements for IoT uh, sustainability today, from my perspective. Great. James, where are you coming from? Sure. So um, we produce technology that allows uh, devices to send data uh, using just sound. Uh, and within that space, we think uh, when we approach IoT that uh, a lot of focus needs to be put on the, the kind of last three feet, the, the edge, the bits where the IoT actually, the things live, because um, the rest is basically just the internet, right? Uh, and, and also, I think simplicity is going to be, be becoming increasingly important as these, as these uh, network systems become hyper-exponentially more, more complex. That's where we're coming from. Great. Nancy? 
Uh, sure. I come from a different lens. So I lead the uh, healthcare vertical practice at Verizon, but I have a background in the space across all the verticals. So I look at it from a use case uh, piece, not a true technology space. So I'm going to share a lot about what Verizon does and how we do it across um, the industries. Um, so what we look at is, I think I agree would agree, the simplicity as we look towards um, our enterprise clients or most of the clients that we work with are looking for custom every time but they want it easy, which is always kind of a hard balance to do. Uh, and uh, that whole internet thing, plus the edge, they focus a lot on the edge, not really the, the whole process. So that's kind of where we come from, is to help them through that process. Hi. Tamara? Sure. Um, I'm with Digital Realty, and from you know my view, um, I could just say that the, the internet of things with its context-sensitive things at the edge of networks, in my view, is an enabler of transformation of our everyday environment into a digital society. Um, and when the device can discern itself digitally, it's more than just a device. Um, so I see that the, 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 the robust uh, you know, interconnected network that is being built through the vast number of devices is just an enabler of transformation. I think also uh, there is another transformation that is taking place as well where inter Internet of Things has a key play. It's transformation of the IT from being a cost center to becoming a revenue generator by the data that is getting developed and collected from the devices and analyzed and pushed out. Um, the data itself becomes a strategic asset mm -hmm. um, and a value of IT, um, it's that much better. So it's just a you know, combination of the transformation of the society um, uh, on, on the social side as well as on the technology side. And David? Uh, I'm Dave Erickson with, with Carrier X. We're an uh, application provider. One of our most popular applications is freeconferencecall.com. Um, in developing that, we've developed uh, global infrastructure. Um, and we're currently uh, starting native wireless, which where we have uh, towers on Native American Indian reservations and rural areas. Uh, we're looking to, in the medium range wireless, machine to machine, um, serve the niche areas. Thanks. Um, I'd like to start off with what, what, what types of technologies and applications are you, are each of you either actually seeing implemented or used today or what what verticals or what, you, what customers types are seeking to do things with your technology, depending on where you're coming from, from the data center side. What are you seeing other people do in the, in the space specifically? And from the, uh, the, the use, use case side and the technology side. Uh, let's you want me to start? Sure, Just Nancy. Just some of the different ones. So uh, it, it, for us, it's pretty agnostic to industry. So um, all the way from you know the media uh, world tracking um, assets, there's a lot of supply chain that's going on and tracking assets of where they are and what they're doing. The, um, the media companies are tracking high, high dollar cameras um, throughout their network. Uh, the food industry is tracking, um, you know, we have an application where we're tracking oysters for all the way from the way, so it's, so it's called um, catch to table. Um, and then in healthcare, there's a, a lot around pharma. It's a $300 billion business that's um, being, uh, unfortunately, being stolen or diverted. Uh, and so they want to be able to track that globally, plus there's some laws that just came through. So there's some other laws about food as well. So the tracking uh, in the supply chain, uh, being able to know what the temperature is on anything. So uh, that's across any industry. So temperature, where it's going, is, has it cross boundaries, geofences, that kind of stuff. Uh, the important piece of that is not what's happening, it's the information and where it's going to. I think to your point that the data from it and the analytics is really the power of it. The asset itself, they're getting smaller and smaller and smaller and less expensive. So it really starts to become agnostic and kind of uh, permeates throughout all, most verticals that we have. Hmm. Uh, James, in, in terms of Chirp and... Yeah, I can maybe add uh, one example, which is a bit... Um, Unusual. We've we've recently done a project with a, a nuclear power station in, in England, and they were, uh, well, they they wanted to. Please tell me it's heat temperature. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, yeah. Well, uh, <coughs> we're doing a number of readings, and uh, yeah. I'm pleased to report they're all nominal. Good. Um, but uh, that was an interesting one because they they 
they've got pieces of equipment in their in their nuclear site which are decades old, and in fact, some of them like cannot be replaced. Um, they, they're just the the parts. Even if the parts existed, they're they're under regulations that they cannot replace these these parts without shutting down the site and you know, it's a heavily restricted environment. And they can't use um, Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. The first thing you do when you go into the site is give up your um, mobile phone. Uh, so they were interested in using our technology uh, to send readings to a, to a data logger just using sound um, in these um, RF-restricted environments. And I think it's it's that's an interesting case where uh, where they've got a unique set of circumstances. They're kind of they've got infrastructure which is aging and which is lots of legacy devices. Uh, and, and they still want to join this IoT revolution. And it's, it's good to think sometimes, I think, about the fact that this IoT rev, uh, revolution is not necessarily needed to be dr driven um, or j just for the latest devices, the latest hardware. Um, there's, there's a lot of legacy systems that um, we can help, our technology amongst many others, to, to bring up to date. Uh, it's not just about the, kind of, uh, the latest gadgets and latest infrastructure, yeah. fast-moving companies. A lot of heavy infrastructure still there. Hmm. Yeah. <coughs> Interesting. Uh, if I can just add from the data center solution provider please do. view, uh, the verticals, you ask about the verticals, definitely healthcare, energy comes to mind. Uh, but more important, exactly. And uh, more importantly, I think that the customers come to us, uh, they see data, center as a, data centers as a data aggregation point. And we see more and more of customers having multi site footprints. Um, uh, with compute getting more and more pushed out to the edge, um, uh, you're starting to see some change. Although the addressable market is getting bigger, you see some change in the dynamics on between the core markets, tier one, tier two, tier three markets. Um, you know, Internet of Things is kind of low margin um, uh, technology that is looking for cost efficiencies, so it's driving, well, as I said, shift of how these tier markets are kind of playing themselves out and the compute at the edge may be pushing a little bit of a downside pressure on the growth of the core markets and pushing them more towards uh, tier two, tier three markets. Um, so generally speaking, I, I would say that the regional markets are getting more, more and more competitive. Um, you know, single nation markets are definitely the most competitive ones. Um, obviously, when we think globally, um, you know, the global footprint is the least competitive. So this is kind of see how you know uh, a cost piece play itself out into where the technology sees itself deployed and 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 kind of see the growth. Right. Jonathan. Yeah, I would agree with that. So from from my perspective, from Sixterra standpoint, we we run uh, global data center operations, but the uh, the government, the federal government, state government uh, utilities are really pushing their compute into a hardened data facility at the edge to minimize latency, uh, reduce costs. Uh, and then get multiple NSPs um, for connectivity to mitigate single points of failure. So uh, smart meters, for example, uh, utilities are moving all smart meter compute into uh, our facilities so uh, they, can, they can save a lot of money on power, space, network services, and then have direct connections to cloud service providers, CDNs, um, and, they're, and they're all on the network. So if there's any sort of outage, customers can still read their meters um, seamlessly uh, from their iPhone. So that's, that's kind of the trend we're seeing. Same, and same in the federal and state governments, they're moving their compute into the, the data center to mitigate um, their, their own issues. Um, government, state governments don't do a good job with managing data centers, so they're outsourcing that locally. Hmm. David, what are you seeing in the wild out there? So I was just in uh, Iowa yesterday, and um, you know, we're seeing things uh, with cattle uh, monitoring Anchor of cattle, yeah. um, you know, where they're able to get uh, more resources out of a cow, I guess you would, you would say it over time, um, by monitoring it, um, farming and uh, energy. Um, one of the, the cool things I've seen is there's a lot of things in um, energy that is still, uh, you know, guy goes out and checks tanks um, because it's so remote and because there's not the communication out there or the connectivity to it. But a simple SIMS card and a cap, you know, with a reader, um, does amazing things. It, it also brings a lot of safety. And so the areas we're trying to look towards are the areas that the efficiency is so great or the, the beneficial and safety is so great that, um, you know, the costs are minute. 
to actually get it get it done. But we're looking at those remote areas that have difficulty with connectivity. Yeah, agriculture is the big one. It, we have a, I still haven't visited it. It's a, um, a winery <laughs> uh, that that we've uh, outfitted their entire um, uh, grape fields for water. So it's it's a combination of not, of how much uh, soil water water the soil needs. Is what I'm trying to say. Um, and then to know when to turn the water on, and, and so it's very interesting that what technology can can do for just certain things that make it a perfect, in this case, perfect grape or a perfect um, agriculture field. It's really interesting. And does does that necessarily need to be connected? Is, is that all on the edge? Yeah. Is it yeah. Going back to the data center. Or yeah. Is um, the the piece, of course, it's going to go up 4G on wireless. Um, it goes up to us, uh, and their their cloud. We're hosting their cloud, but um, their their data. Yeah. Soon to be 5G. Uh, not for that application, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to follow up on on all these technologies, is is this delivering on the promise of Internet of Things? Is this what we expected? Is 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 you know, what is the reality of the state of, of all this now? Is this in, at a very early stage, where we're going to see a lot more, or is is this what we're what we, should, what we should be expecting? Is a lot of different little implementations like this? Uh, well, I, I don't know. I, I can give a view on that. Uh, I think that uh, Internet of Things is obviously evolving. It suffers presently suffers mainly from platform disintegration and a lack of technical standardization. Um, that in turn makes integration on plat hardware or pl hardware platforms and variety of software that may be running on top of them harder. Um, we are obviously in a cycle of uh, high innovation. Uh, there is a disruptive environment. Uh, I think the most if innovation is happening is at the interface of the software and hardware. Uh, with uh, the, you know, the greatest uh, you know, advances we are making is in software uh, innovation. So I think you know, some of these issues, such as the technical, lack of technical standards and different technologies mashed together, will solve themselves over time. It's just a matter of um, going through the cycles, in my view. Yeah, I would, I would add, there is a technical problem. I think everyone, the, the, there's no lack of ideas of what could be monitored and why. Uh, and to me, I see that as an opportunity for a lot of us to provide the enablement of putting them all together to create the service. And that's what we find we're doing a lot of. They want to do this, but it takes too much of that, and they're, they're not quite sure how to put it all together. So to us, that's an opportunity, I think. Hmm. David? Well, I, w I was, you know, building my first voice video and data call center in 1995 and found myself a little bit ahead of the curve in video. Um, and I think that, that, you know, looking too far into the, you know, what it's going to provide rather than just looking at what's right in front of us, what can be done right now, what makes the differences right now. I mean, I believe in doing things for the greater good, um, but, you know, you're not much good if you can't turn a profit and, and uh, make money in, in it right now. And so we always focus on the now. Um, but I think it's going to probably take a little longer to get the, you know, the ultimate of Internet of Things uh, than, than people expect. It's just putting the proper infrastructure out, dealing with the security issues and things um, sometimes take a little longer. But I think that uh, the momentum is, is gaining, and that's, that's the key, right? There's plenty of money to be made. Jonathan? Yeah, I would agree with that. I think two big problems right now with IoT. So in NFL cities, we don't have any issues right from a, from a network perspective. We have dark fiber, we have lit fiber, we have 4G, we have 5G's coming. The ubiquity across the country, though, is pretty, there's a lot of rural areas that have lack of bandwidth, right? You know, Verizon and AT&T and CenturyLink are trying to roll out DSL. So there's a, there's a kind of a network element issue in rural America, so it's going to take a little bit longer. You can use HughesNet, but you have some latency issues. So there's some of those concerns. The other issue is security. So half of every IoT firm has been breached, which has resulted in a 13% revenue decline. So IoT firms have to leverage secure services to mitigate those, those, those issues. So those are the two, two big gaps I see today um, from my perspective. Mm. James? Yeah, I would kind of agree with what's what's been said. I think it's uh, to echo your statements. It's important that there's there's a, a viable value add for existing um, um, solutions. They're going in just to do one thing really well, whether it's tracking wine or oysters, um, and and providing an ROI just doing that. 
that's how we get the infrastructure in. And then, uh, and then what I'm excited about, and it will take standardization, which has already been mentioned, but that's, that's the kind of easy on-ramp to get us to, to a, a place where <coughs> the infrastructure is there, the hardware is there, the standards are there. And then what I'm most excited about is the application of, um, of machine learning into that space to, to draw out the emerging um, behaviors uh, that are underlying some of this data. I think we're still a, a, a while away from that, um, and I'm, I'm glad that it seems like a kind of logical step towards that that uh, that, that space. But um, that's what excites me longer term. Okay. I would just have two additional comments. The security piece. I think uh, it's not just at the edge or the device. It's also um, you know the, the platform itself, and then the network all the way through to make sure. So it's really the security issue is a big problem that needs to be looked at in each area. And then um, I completely agree with you. You want to do something that, that can make money now, or is right sitting right there. What what we're also seeing in, in the um, industry is the ability to say, you know, I put this tracking uh, device on whatever I'm doing, but I notice that I have a whole lot of downtime on it. And so this whole share platform or share opportunity has come come to fruition. Of you can use my wood chipper or my tractor or my because I know the downtimes of it and I can track where you have and I can track different things. So it's created another opportunity for a lot of the customer base too. That now I know where my asset is or what's happening in whatever it is, uh, and be able to share that with uh, within their industry or within people or the community. Several of you have touched on on security. So let's jump quickly to that to that in more detail. How, how advanced is security for the Internet of Things, and how seriously do we need to take the uh, the potential risks in there? I think with the the vast number of devices um, interconnected, the the attack surface is getting bigger. <laughs> Therefore, the protection is getting more complex, um, and it's ever evolving task. So from from what I see, you know, there's plenty of talent out there, but I still think there is a lack of true types of talent that is needed to solve some of these complex situations. So I think we are in a shortage of um, professionals out there that can uh, be plugged in into these complex scenarios. Um, on, on, the, on the other hand, I think that you know security uh, services, either as a managed service, uh, it is um, kind of outdated uh, if, if you think of it in terms of the fixed annuals, contracts with such and such a provider. That usually doesn't give you the full, you know, you know, stack protection. That it's kind of looks good on paper, but in reality it has falses and problems. I think you know the whole model of, you know, annualized contracts with either third-party service providers who protect you needs to be revisited and more move towards like service as uh, security as a service type of a, uh, approach, uh, just because it's so much in flex in, and so much changing that mm -hmm. it's hard to pinpoint a standard and then uh, address it. It's just keep on evolving. Yeah. Jonathan? Well, yeah, and security security is an investment, right? So these firms that did invest in security services actually um, weren't, weren't affected, right, by, by, by these breaches. So I think it was a, I have a, I have a stat here uh, that 65% um, of, of, of firms that invested in security um, across their IOT uh, didn't have an issue. So um, while it costs a little bit more short term, long term it pays huge dividends, right? You don't have downtime, you don't have DDoS attacks, you're not losing your eyeballs, you're not losing your, your business, your continuity is up. So it's, it's up to the IOT providers. Hopefully they go into a hardened data facility to mitigate points of failure from a network perspective, but also on the security side, um, th th they need to invest in, uh, in security services um, and it's low margin. A lot of this IoT stuff is low margin, but um, but it's at least for the for the wireless providers, it's a it's it's a new net new revenue for their declining um, uh, uh, use uh, wireless use um, revenue. So um, that's. I think it's also about the awareness of the risks out there. So these um, devices or things, uh, they usually get installed and left alone. <laughs> After a very simple setup, uh, default passwords are rarely changed. Um, firmware may or may not be existing on a device and would or would not be upgraded or refreshed. So you have this vast um, exposure 
um, that um, we have seen incidents. We have, we have seen recently what was there, like a DDoS attack that took advantage of the IP cameras and kind of fell back on itself. Um, just look at the, the amount of these devices that are out there. Just tells you that the risk. We have to be very much aware of the risk and pretty much looking at these uh, installed bays as your exposure. I I think that um, <clears throat> you know the the guys that fraud networks and things and hack things um, are are amazing minds and they're very creative and there's no way to 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 you know wade into the pool of IoT and come out with the security solutions and in, in, in advance of you know, the blocking and tackling of getting it moving. And we're going to see more. We're going to see things that we never even dreamed of before and, and what they do with all of this. You know, you start talking about, you know, 20, 30 billion devices out there with, with some form of connectivity to, you know, things that have uh, value in them, information, um, assets. Uh, that's, that's a treasure trove. And it's going to be attacked, and it's going to be continually attacked, and it's going to be attacked from this point forward. And, and I think that it's all about diligence. It's all about the information, looking at the information. But it's going to be an ongoing thing. Um, but that's, that's, that's what this is about, security. Um, they're going to create new ways to break in, and we're going to find ways to, to shut it down. And being diligent and being on top of that network is going to be the key. In terms of the technology, James, in terms of building things that work on this, how do you approach security? So we, we kind of uh, we approach it in quite a, a holistic way because, because our technology is broadcast into the um, open air. We actually think that there's some interesting applications of, of, of our technology where uh, the fact that it's audible, I mean, just, just to state the obvious, the fact that you can hear when data is being transmitted and these machines aren't talking behind your back, so to speak, um, for, for certain type of um, um, privacy or security situations, it's really useful to know if a device is talking to a network, right? Um, and, uh, and so, in certain applications, our, our technology works well. When you, well, if if it's if it's talking to the network, I'll be able to hear it. Well, I can keep an eye on it, and uh, there's no there's no uh, uh, kind of talking behind my back. Hmm. It's almost like you have to start to regulate it, um, and I think we are starting to see that. Um, I think the National Aviation Organization, something like that, they are regulating drones. Um, so you have to comply with the uh, regulatory requirements if you want to fly drones. Um, the same is in, uh, in the self-driving vehicles. Uh, that industry is also get, getting regulated. Uh, I think it's just the beginning. I think it's going to be more. Um, and I think it's probably the right direction. Yeah. Nancy, in terms of the, the healthcare side of things, is that also security a big issue? Well, yes. Um, again, every industry has security and regulations and, and um, requirements that they have to go by. Healthcare has uh, protected health information. Most of the IoT applications in healthcare are not around patient health information. It's around moving assets globally and into a facility and tracking them for ROI for operational pieces. They're not. They're sending, like for remote patient monitoring, they're sending on encrypted devices your, excuse me, your blood pressure, but it's not attached to Nancy Green until it gets into the platform and then it's, then it's un, undone. So uh, it, it's, a, it's an issue across the board. I don't know about regulation, but that's just because <laughs> we're overregulated, in my opinion. But. All right. <coughs> Shifting topics. Um, what kind of services and infrastructure are required to keep up with the ongoing rollout of, it, of IoT stuff? Um, and what are the, how does it, how do people implementing IoT buy technologies from infrastructure providers, et cetera, differently than other provider, other buyers currently? Um, Jonathan? Well, again, I sound like a broken record, but hardened data facility, interconnectivity, multiple carriers to mitigate single points of failure, the ability to connect via dark fiber and lit fiber to their corporate facility, putting all their mission critical IoT eyeballs in that data center to mitigate <coughs> points of failure is, is, really, is, really, the, is really the pitch. Um, it saves them money in the long haul. 
um, on, on network services, there aren't any local loops, single mode fiber cross connects from their, their compute to the NSPs, they have direct connect, reduces latency, and those, those data centers, uh, the Sixtera data centers, for example, sit in NFL cities, so these government entities can still have um, sub one, two millisecond round trip performance so they can run active active replication um, as well. So that's kind of the, that's kind of the, that, that, that's kind of what IoT um, firms are doing, utilities and government, healthcare. Um, again, it's, we go back to, I don't want to security again, but it's, it's, we have to make sure that these IoT um, users are using the best new security services. Sixtera has a new SDP platform that's completely different from kind of the um, standard security services out there. 256A is encryption, has to be used. A lot of these wireless providers use 128 and, and that's been breached. They've had DDoS attacks, they've, been, they've had issues. So um, there has to be an investment in the, the network as well as the security on top of it. Okay. Tomorrow? Oh yeah, I agree. It's, uh, it's really about investing in infrastructure. Um, uh, if you think of it just in the context of Internet of Things, if you don't pay attention to infrastructure unless or until your service is down. <laughs> when you're down, then you start scratching your head, you see what went wrong. Um, and today, in spite of all this, um, you know, uh, the, the how advancements, how far we got, we still can have a very large, uh, you know, <coughs> issues or failures in the network infrastructure. So I think it's all about the uptime. It's all about the ability to uh, resiliency. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the examples, I think, just it was quite a few weeks, uh, years back, where it was a business dispute between appearing uh, providers or appearing entities such as Cogent and Sprint. I think they would had this business dispute and they held up 3,500 3, networks uh, that essentially partitioned the internet. And you can see that this can still happen. So investing in infrastructure, finding those resiliency models, and how you can, you know, uh, survive attacks, I think is the key. Hmm. David, um, you know, my, my my thought is, in, in you know, looking at medium range, um, our networks, the way the uh, the networks are advertised, it, it, you know, when they say they they cover ninety percent of the country, they they cover ninety percent of the population. Um, and there's a huge area, if you start looking at devices, devices are populated in other areas than, than people. I mean, that's, that's one of the reasons behind you know, the whole idea of the devices out there. So taking that network and looking and redoing the population thing and trying to get to 90% um, coverage of the device population is, is what, what I think needs to happen. And, and in order for there to be a seamless thing happening within the country, it's gotta be spread just like we did across 90% of the human population. Hmm. I think um, the reason it's 90% of the population is because they're the ones traditionally carrying phones. As the business model starts to change to there's devices out there and there's technology and there's revenue sources, I think you'll start to see that change. I think when um, what we have found when we talk to enterprise clients is that they're initially not real worried about the security of the network. They kind of think that we have it if they're coming over us. They're more worried about how do I do this, and I, have already, I like this piece of the, the value chain, and I like that, and I like that, and how do I put it all together? And that's where you get into what's the security of each piece of the chain, uh, and then uh, how do I buy it as a service rather than invest in infrastructure. Uh, as a customer, they want it as a service. Um, and so the, the challenges have been that they want to customize every single one of them, and you know, 90% of it's not really custom; it's just their particular application. Um, so, uh, and they want, and what we found is as much automation as you can put into the process, the easier the security layer is. The less touches and movement of the of the of the data, the better um, side of the business that that happens. But network capacity is a big one. Okay, James. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll take a little bit of a different perspective because uh, obviously our technology li lives exclusively um, at the at the edge, and I've, uh, as I as I mentioned uh, <coughs> earlier, we're we're interested when it comes to infrastructure uh, in taking advantage of existing um, hardware that's 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 out there, and so so. Uh, for example, <coughs> I'm, I'm talking to you over, over a PA system, and, and with our technology, uh, it's 
Well, it's 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 audio. I could I could um, hold up my mobile phone and send you all some data um, using the existing hardware in the room. Obviously, this wasn't designed um, to transmit data over sound, um, but with our technology, we can take advantage of stuff in the world that is already capable of sending and receiving audio uh, can now send and receive data. So, so yeah, <coughs> the infrastructure play is a little bit different for us, but uh, we're, we, we think that's really exciting because there's already billions of devices out there which are compatible with our technology and can now send and receive data. Are there things that the industry doesn't provide that you wish they did or ways that they would could package infrastructure better to help you do what you do? Yeah, I've, I've got a very long list. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Hit the top highlighter too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, um, audio typically hasn't, hasn't been taken um, as seriously as, as, as visual. You know, there's been lots of investments in screens. Um, it is catching up now with, with, I don't want to get too off topic, but it is ca catching up with, with um, audio and VR now. But um, commodity hardware, like, like you'll find in our iPhone, uh, is typically good enough for us. So not too many complaints. Yeah. For, for any of the rest of you, are there things that IoT providers are asking for that you can't give them yet that you wish you could give them? From my angle, it's total cost of ownership. <laughs> Always looking for a bottom line. So uh, if you can kind of, uh, you know, even public cloud is still still expensive. Uh, no matter how much is out there, it's still expensive. So I think it's always, um, when you go to a provider, you're always looking in your head, you know, how can I save money? <laughs> you know, he talks about making money and whoever comes, you know, thinks about the service provider, how can I get the best deal? So it's total cost of ownership very much. Total cost of ownership and we in get the there. the deployment of your solution. So for instance, yeah. it's not just the devices and the software, it's where it goes, where it gets aggregated, it's full stack. Right. You know, from device to the application and the business analytics, where all of that sits and, and, and how you get the maximum return on your investment. So when you go to, when you well, talk, talking about data aggregation points, data centers, you're obviously looking at, the, you know, where is your best value in, in terms of which markets you go to, where is the, you know, the rates are the most attractive. Right. And automation is a key to to, mm -hmm. to get to reaching yes. that lower total cost of ownership. Yes, is very much. Jonathan, I mean, from a from a data center perspective, the, the the network service providers have done a fantastic job building out Metro Fiber, uh, Dark Fiber, 100 Gig OWS, Terabit, etc. It's the rural areas that are, are that are challenged. So while we can provide the IoT uh, power and space and cool it 35 40 kilowatts um, per cabinet. Um, it's those rural areas that, that are still having challenges. Again, it goes back to investing in the rural America. Uh, I know there's a CAF fund out there that's a federally subsidized fund that CenturyLink and AT&T and Verizon are taking advantage of to try and, and, and provide more fiber in the rural areas. But um, that's, that's, the, that's the biggest challenge. If somebody can figure that out, um, they're going to do really well. There's no ubiquity uh, across. And I know it's 10% of the population, but it's still, still a good chunk. Mm -hmm. And I think small cell technology answers cell. to some of those challenges, mm -hmm. you know, with self-organizing networks to take advantage of interferences between the small cells. I think that's where it's that last stretch extension of first you have a fiber off the cable, then you have a short wireless runs, and then you have these self-organizing networks around the small cells technology. I think that's definitely going to enable reaching to remote areas. And fill in a few gaps. Yes. Of course. David, yes. any thoughts? Yeah, I, you know, I think the... The thing we're, we're looking for is more, more apps that apply um, to people that are looking for savings or safety or um, you know, some, some, some value to them and, you know, like in, in, in the now. I think there's a lot of hype around things that are really groovy technologies um, and, and I want to see those continue, you know, for the, for the good of everything, but I think that... Um, We've, as a group, got to really, you know, get concerned with you know, what we can do right right now in applications that bring these savings, things that get the consumer to buy. And so I think there's a lot of excitement here, but we need to build more excitement in the consumer saying, you know what, I need to manage my farm that way. I need to do this. I need to do that. And, and you know, uh, a, a higher take rate on the Internet of Things. 
Right. Well, we've got five or ten minutes left. I'd wonder if there's any questions from the audience. Um, it was very interesting some of the comments made on how to make or where the money is. And you described the value chain that, broadly speaking, is the devices, the, the network, the data collection and management, and the analytics. Where's the money to be made from an outsider looking at that value chain? It, it, we heard it was mention of low margins on the one side, the, the, the technology side. The networks are certainly challenged in terms of the economics. Uh, is, is data and analytics where the money is going to be made? Is, is this going to turn out like OTT has, where they're making the money off of the networks? Any perspectives? Anyone want to tackle that one? Where's the money? <laughs> Yeah, I think you're right. The, the money's in the analytics, right? Because the, the 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 network it's expensive, right? To 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 invest in and to upgrade, and you know, c cable providers are having a tough time competing with, with with other providers out there. So I think it's the analytics. I think it's like the the uh, you know, like the Amazon Alexas, right? That sit there in your house and they're studying you and they're they're getting analytics and they're going to start selling to you right so those types of additional value adds are, are is, is going to be where the margin is going to be made i would take it uh, probably a little bit uh, more where we've seen the struggle which is integrators is to be able to, to value it all uh, and uh, the data from that thing that's sending information that data belongs to the customer or the person you're putting it in you don't normally own the data as a provider so it's very hard to resell that, that product for any length. What you're trying to do is actually do the analytics and help them. So I call it the secret sauce. There's a lot of people doing a lot of different things. How you analyze the data and provide that information for your customer to do what they're trying to do is really, I think, where um, the uniqueness is in the marketplace. Yeah, I agree. It's, uh, data is definitely a strategic asset. Um, and uh, probably that's where the most of the profits can be made. But um, there is also services. You know, it's just simple, you know, monitoring, data collection, you know, services. That that's the piece that's also uh, can be monetized, uh, leveraging the the infrastructure. Um, I I think the money's in in subscriptions to connectivity because um, that's what I'm in. <laughs> uh, and and I think the 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 more it's a niche, the the better. I think that. Um, Looking at the areas that can uh, do incredible things but have, you know, really bad connectivity or no connectivity. Uh, Pine Ridge, uh, the, the Aguala Sioux, uh, that reservation is like 4.2 million acres or something. That's a lot of land and there's like zero connectivity out there. Um, a few towers, that all changes. Um, what can be done with that? You know, amazing things. Um, so I think it's in, in, in that connectivity, the subscriptions. Um, there's not a whole lot of data moved in some applications and a lot more data moved in others. Um, but that's why we look at the subscriptions. Is there room for the next, say, killer app or killer technology, James? That kind of thing? Uh, yeah, I think, I think um, David was right about it being uh, about us really trying to encourage uh, the market to... to take some of this excitement that that, that, that uh, we feel within the industry. I think as soon as we start better demonstrating that, that um, the, 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 the money, the killer app, that won't be a problem. I think it's, it's, it's demonstrating the, um, the return first. Right. Any additional questions from the audience? So overall, in this case, just tack on to the, the money community. I assume the end user in business case of the enterprises using it are, are owning it. Are you seeing early adopters be ones that are experimenting and know they lose money early on, or are you seeing it accelerate? What's the adoption rate you guys are seeing from the end user perspective? I can take it first if you want to. Um, it depends, for us, it depends on the vertical. Uh, smart cities, smart grid, that went out first and, you know, was, was all over the place. Healthcare traditionally is very laggers. Um, but what pushed 
uh, that was a regulation around the drug industry, uh, and that pushed it hard. So f all the way fr from um, uh, manufacturer all the way eventually it'll get to the to you and the pill. So those regulations really pushed IoT in that space. Other ones are um, they're dabbling in it to see what the ROI is. For us, it's really an ROI, or what we see is the customers are wanting an ROI before they roll it out everywhere. So they'll pick niche use cases. I don't know if you had any other changes. Uh, do you want to come? We've, we've always had a multi-prong attack and, and uh, you know, going into the, the medium range, connectivity with, with uh, you know, the machine-to-machine -machine type stuff. Um, We've, we've done it by going with networks that we already have kind of a foothold in areas and expanding that. And so that, that cuts the cost quite a bit and, and, and hopefully gets us to, to nice profits quickly. Um, but we have other things in those same areas where we're delivering applications in those same, same rural communities that are kind of the, the catalyst or, or sort of the launching pad for our new endeavors into it. It's proof points, I guess I would add. It's proof points. And we had one pharma that did a pilot, a pilot of just one pallet that went from uh, their, their manufacturing site across uh, and was uh, diverted uh, as it got to the U.S. And we found it because we tracked it, and that was the savings of like $300 million. So they rolled it out immediately, right? But if we had tracked it, then we may have had to track a couple more pallets before something happened. So sometimes it's just that proof point that they know that they're losing it, they know what's happening, or they know that they have to share this data or get access to it, uh, and then it's worth the cost for them. The, uh, the nuclear um, project that I mentioned earlier, uh, they were interested in us to keep connecting devices which weren't otherwise connected to um, mitigate the risk of unplanned downtime, and uh, if they have an unplanned outage, they, they've got a figure, uh, um, which I know but ca can't say, uh, of which, <laughs> which is against how much it costs if the, if the station has to go down for, for a day, right? And if they can, if they can connect devices to, um, to the cloud and, and monitor them to prevent this unplanned downtime, then they, they, they know. That they know when it's going to fail. They can watch the operation, and they can they can take action before that part fails. Uh, do that in one one nuclear site, and then roll it out across their nuclear sites all around Europe. Um, so sometimes it doesn't the the, the kind of it doesn't need to be that that complicated. Sometimes it is quite black and white, and you can say if we do this, um, here's the numbers. It's pretty clear. And on the question on the adoption, I don't know, I will be curious to see what people think in this room, whether the cloud is considered an emerging technology or mature technology. Um, I see Internet of Things as still emerging technology. So it's just that where I think it's in its, in its evolution path. Mm -hmm. And it actually says it's challenging. It has the startups, it has all this, you know, full stack to the enterprise level solutions as well as the, the small startups. Okay. Last question from over here. Sure. Um, myths versus realities. Tech sector is very good at predicting and making forecasts about the updates there. Everyone wants to talk about the number of devices on the network. And, you know, we're talking about the sets of ideas and the finance and storage and you know, generate all this data. But very rarely do we hear about how many updates it's going to traverse the network. How do you guys actually start forecasting for that to make sure that It's a great question. <laughs> Anybody want to try it? So, so, so uh, you know, uh, our, our goal is, is, is to float the boat with what we can do today, which is, you know, kind of uh, some of the stuff networks we build have been very custom to like a regional area. Um, we talked a little bit, I didn't, didn't weigh in about, you know, the future of like the killer app. I wholeheartedly 110% believe that that app is coming and that we don't even know what it is yet. Um, I think that there's going to be lots, lots of apps. I think you've, you know, if, if you're really interested in this, if you're like Carrier X, we're a self-funding organization. Um, so we've never taken any institutional money or debt, and, and we look to like get into this in a way that we can go and do something that's very valuable today, 
but that opens us to a, a wide range of opportunities in the future that, that you know, some of we haven't put our finger on yet. And some of it we'll look to press in on and you know, may have to, have to back out. That's just kind of the nature of this. I think there's you know, very intelligent people that can paint us a beautiful vision of what's going to happen here. Um, I, I, I don't buy into all of it. I mean, I like it. I want to read it. I want to understand their, their, their smart thinking. But I think that if you press in and you do things that you can make money with today, um, you, will, you will find an opportunity in this, this marketplace. So and I think virtualization or software defined networks, uh, I think that's probably an answer to what you you know, kind of asking killer app. Uh, it's, it's definitely a, you know, an area that, that's driving the, the oversubscription rates possible to be resold like at that level when you're, when you're selling capacity and, and you know it's dynamic and it's, it's managed by you know, software if you would. I think it's definitely a, a help in trying to get a handle on the traffic. So, so the good news is that bandwidth is is pretty much infinite, right? So it's fiber, and then it's electronics on top of it. So NSPs like Level 3 and Verizon and Zeo and CenturyLink are, are upgrading their backbone, right? It used to be 10 gigs, and now it's 100 gigs, and then it's going to be 400 gigs, and then it's a terabit. So the bandwidth's going to be there, so that's the good news. It's, it, it, it's, the, it's the actual power and space of the data, right? The human genome, the AI, the driverless cars, this stuff is going to, this stuff is going to take up a lot of power and space. So um, it's, it's, the bandwidth's not the problem, at least, at least in the metro areas, right? In the, in the NFL cities, you're going to be in good shape. Anybody else? I, I'm going to disagree that bandwidth is the problem. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it is an issue. And I think, uh, and I talk about this a lot, when you innovate at the core, which is network, how you're doing things, how you're moving data, how you're storing it, you can innovate at the edge easier, right? So the edge seems to drive all the apps and all the fun stuff. But if your core technologies as a carrier, as an enterprise, those technologies haven't been innovated around mm -hmm. SDN or whatever, to be able to really be agile in that world, you're going to have um, some, some more problems as you expand out into, into the business. Um, to answer your question, I know that there's people in Verizon that do that. I have no idea how they do it. But that's why we keep continuing to innovate at that network core around how to move the data, whether it's on our wireless networks or whether it's on our wireline line networks, whatever network you're on. And those, even in the Fios business, they, they have to look at what's the movement uh, of data and where we're going with that. Yeah, that's the, that, that's the, the electronics we were talking about. That's what Verizon's doing. So it's the core, it's usually an Infinera or it could be a Sienna box, but they're, they're constantly upgrading the core. Uh, all the NSPs are, right? For, the, for, the, for, for wireless, for metro, and then also dark fiber provides you infinite amounts of bandwidth in the metro. I, I was uh, driving through rural America and um, I, 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 I have an AT&T phone. Um, That's why. And, and it went, <laughs> that is right. In Iowa, that, that is right. Um, and uh, I lost everything, right? I didn't have uh, voice. I didn't have internet. I was using a map. Uh, oh, no. A printed you know, map. I was, you know, we, we, me and my partner kind of laughed about it. Um, like, we're lost, you know. But... Uh, uh, that's interesting to me, right? Thank that you. was a real eye-opener to me that all of the things that I depend upon in this city on that phone just went out the window for a minute there and it was like, oh. So I wonder how driverless cars work through there, driverless trucks, all these things in those kind of areas. And that's why, you know, I've kind of been banging the gong of, of, of medium range uh, connectivity, but I think, you know, there's a big gap there. Yeah, we, and, and, uh, and, and I get peripheral, I get to talk to, um, engineers within our company about that, how they're trying to partner with the trains to put cells on trains as they go through or in drones on, on blue weather balloons to get to the areas where, and they're really looking at lots of different ways to get into the rural communities that are really fascinating. Uh, so we're piloting them ourselves to get that type of connectivity out there. Hmm. Well, thank you very much to all our panelists. Everybody give them a hand.